and Stephen Grant seemed to epitomize the American dream, the big house in an upscale neighborhood, the two kids, and Tara's high-flying career. What nobody knows is just how jealous Stephen is about having to stay home and play Mr. Mom while his wife keeps climbing the corporate ladder. And when Stephen's jealousy explodes into an incomprehensible act of violence, no one in the Grant household will ever be the same. Hello and welcome to The Dark Side of Love. I'm your host, Bianca Sloan, author of suspense novels about the dark side of love. And this week I'm putting a spotlight on the case I'm calling Murder in Michigan. Tara Lynn Stramp was born in 1972 in a rural community in Michigan's Upper Peninsula, known for its waterfalls, abundance of wildlife, and hiking trails. Described and scorned Love Kills as a smart and pretty farm girl possessing a knack for organization and a drive for success, Tara has dark, curly red hair and a wide, welcoming smile. The Macomb Daily noted that she was known to be, quote, an exceptional student and athlete, participating in cheerleading, basketball, band, and the yearbook. Tara always had high hopes for herself, and to fulfill those dreams, after graduating near the top of her high school class, she went on to major in business at Michigan State University, which counts such notable alums as Magic Johnson, Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer, Chris Hansen from To Catch a Predator, and rapper Eminem's daughter, Hallie Jade. While Tara was a standout who left an impression on everyone she met, her future husband, Stephen Grant, was somewhere between average and totally forgettable. Stephen was six feet tall, an avid runner, and average looking. He attended Henry Ford High School in Sterling Heights, which is a suburb of Detroit, but unlike Tara, he wasn't a joiner, notching no extracurricular activities during his high school career, but at least one brush with the law when he and some buddies lit some firecrackers inside of a homemade pipe. One childhood friend who wanted to remain anonymous told the Macomb Daily, quote, if you'd known the kid I knew, if you knew that, Stephen, you wouldn't have believed he was going to turn out so okay when he grew up with a decent job, such a beautiful wife, and two beautiful kids. You wouldn't have thought that. So nobody has any high hopes for Stephen. But all of that changed when he met the ambitious Tara through friends at Michigan State. When they met, he asked her out and she said no. So the two of them became friends. And even though she didn't have any romantic feelings for him, like so many people, Stephen saw something in Tara and he persisted in developing a relationship with her, even going so far as to attend her grandmother's funeral, despite the fact that she had a boyfriend, despite the fact that he wasn't invited. But why let a little thing like an invitation get in the way? It seems as though Tara found the gesture touching, and according to what Stephen told the Detroit News the next day, she called and told him that she loved him. And that was that. While Tara had continued to diligently pursue her education, eventually graduating from MSU with honors in 1994 with a business degree, Stephen had dropped out to pursue a career in politics, going to work for former Michigan State Senator Jack Faxon, first as an intern and later as a staffer from 1993 to 1994. Jack Faxon wasn't terribly impressed with young Stephen, finding him, like so many, to be completely undistinguished and unmemorable. He told the Macomb Daily that in the years after working for him, Stephen would call him whenever he had a milestone in his life, like he's getting married or he's having kids. And according to Jack, quote, he'd have to remind me who he was. He was nice, cordial, but struck me as maybe one of these sorts of people who hangs on, you might say. So, again, Stephen is not setting the world on fire by any stretch of the imagination. Now, Tara's sister Alicia was also not a fan of her sister's boyfriend, finding him, as Dateline noted, to be a smug underachiever. She would tell the Detroit Free Press about her future brother-in-law, quote, his personality was very controlling, always had to get the last word, always had to be right, to the point where he would put other people down just to make a point. Alicia says that she didn't speak up regarding her feelings about her sister's boyfriend, and eventually Stephen proposed to Tara on the steps of the Detroit Museum of Art, a nod to Tara's love of art. 
Tara and Stephen married in September of 1996, and like a lot of young couples starting out, they struggled. After Jack Faxon left office in 1994, Stephen had trouble finding another job and went to work at his father's tool and die shop, USG Babbitt, while Tara took a temp position with Morrison Knudsen, a civil engineering and construction company which was later acquired by the Washington Group. Tara quickly excelled in her job, climbing huge steps up the ladder to management. In November of 2000, she gave birth to her and Stephen's first child, a girl they named Lindsay, who was joined in November of 2002 by little brother Ian. The couple later purchased a house in the picturesque Detroit suburb of Washington Township, the kind of place they put on the back of postcards with its lush trees, magazine-worthy homes, and carefree kids playing in the street. While Tara was soaring in her career, Stephen was stuck in his, if you call it that, uh, because the truth is a stable career had eluded him, and he was forced to continue working part-time for his dad at the tool and die shop making ball bearings. Over time, Tara became the undisputed breadwinner, earning a six-figure salary while crisscrossing the globe for business. While Tara brought home the bacon, Stephen stayed home and cooked it becoming the primary caretaker for the kids, taking them to soccer practice, helping with homework, all the things. The picture that the world saw was that of a hardworking mother, two beautiful children, a devoted dad, a lovely home. But what no one could see was the rot beneath all of that beauty. The truth is, Stephen was seething with jealousy over Tara's success. While Tara is jet-sitting around the world, Stephen, as he sees it, is home, stuck with two kids, a less-than-part-time job toiling at his father's tool-and-die shop, making a paltry four figures a year compared to Tara's six. He feels neglected, emasculated, forgotten, unseen, emotions he'd no doubt felt his entire life. As his friend had said about him to the Macomb Daily that he achieved what he did by virtue of marrying Tara and having two beautiful kids in a beautiful home in this beautiful suburb, nobody saw that coming because, again, nobody expected Stephen to set the world on fire. Tara is the superstar, and he's not. And he hates it. He seethes about it. But Stephen is nothing if not clever, so he decides the way back to being the king of the hill is to surround himself with adoring minions. Specifically, he tells Tara that he wants to hire an au pair, which is a helper who moves in uh, with a family to take, help take care of the children. And for Stephen, only a beautiful young au pair will do, of course. And it's not long before he has a parade of them in and out of the house. What he wants is to control them, have them worship at his feet, do whatever he tells them to do, be his slaves, basically. And he tells everyone that these au pairs, these hot young au pairs, are crazy about him and that they are constantly throwing themselves at him, coming on to him. None of these women are coming on to him. He is the one making all of the advances and being extra creepy. For example, he apparently drilled a hole in his closet so that he could watch them getting undressed in their bedroom. And there was another time that he stood in the yard watching one of them get undressed, telling one of his neighbors that she was doing it all for him and that all he could do was stare helplessly. I mean, it's disgusting, totally disgusting. So Stephen doesn't manage to get any of these au pairs into bed, and he's getting a little frustrated because he thinks he's due. It's his time. Um, But then a few things happen. One, He comes across some emails that Tara, who's been promoted by this point to office operations manager for her company's Puerto Rico office, is exchanging with a friend, a co-worker. They are totally innocent emails, but Stephen hates the idea of his wife talking to any other man, no matter the circumstances, and he convinces himself that she's cheating on him. And after all, if anyone was going to be having affairs in this marriage, not that Tara's having any, But if anyone is going to be having affairs, it's going to be Stephen. The second thing that happens is that he hires 19-year-old Verena Dirks as an au pair. Originally from Germany, Verena is gorgeous by gorgeous standards. Cute figure, blonde hair, considered to be absolutely stunning. 
Stephen decides she's the one. She is the one who he is finally going to get into his bed. So he starts to subtly manipulate her. For one, he innocently asks her to read the emails between Tara and her co-worker and asks her what she thinks because he wants to plant the seed that he is the poor, neglected husband, the long-suffering Mr. Mom who's stuck at home with the kids while his wife is having affairs all around the world. Oh, don't you feel bad for me. According to Verena, Stephen flirted with her for months, which she admits she did not take seriously. Then on February 1st of 2007, he point blank says to her, I want to sleep with you. He then starts to send her emails telling her that he's feeling, quote, itchy, which I guess was his cute way of saying that he was itching to have sex. Again, subtle. Meanwhile, things are swirling down the drain between him and Tara fast. She spends her weeks typically in Puerto Rico, and when she comes home on the weekends, she and Stephen are fighting constantly. Her travel is, of course, a major sticking point, but more than that, Stephen does not feel as though Tara gives him the respect that he feels he is due. He feels ignored, he feels forgotten, and he blames all of this on Tara. And he sees Verena, the au pair, as a means towards recapturing his self-esteem and quote-unquote lost masculinity. So, Stephen starts to step up his seduction game, giving her a foot rub one night while they're watching TV, and this is also when they share their first kiss. Verena says that as time went on, they began cuddling and kissing in bed, and that finally, on February 8th, he invites her into the bed that he shares with his wife, Tara, and they have a sexual encounter. Not actual sex, but enough to make her feel as though Stephen really cares about her. As George Hunter, a reporter with the Detroit News and co-author of a book about the case titled Limb from Limb, says in Scorned Love Kills, quote, Verena was the perfect clay for Stephen to mold. In other words, he wants to swap out the wife he has for the woman he wants. The next day, Tara returns home from Puerto Rico while Stephen sends Verena out of the house. Tara informs her husband that she is literally home for just a few hours and has to turn right back around and go back to Puerto Rico. The two argue, and according to Stephen, Tara calls for a car to come and pick her up, and that was the last he saw of her. So Verena gets back to the house that night around 1130, and she says that Stephen comes running down the stairs screaming, what the F are you doing home? Like, he, she's caught him doing something. Um, and after he calms down, he tells her that he and Tara had a huge fight and that she left in a black sedan headed to the airport. It's at this point that Stephen and Verena start playing house. They're acting like a married couple while they're taking care of the kids, and it's just all kind of creepy. Um, a few days pass and nobody has seen or heard from Tara. Stephen even calls her job and basically says, you know, it's no big deal. She's missing. She does this. Tara does not do this. And it isn't until February 14th, Valentine's Day, that Stephen finally reports that his wife is missing. So Verena's au pair agency, they immediately pull her out of the house since understandably, they don't want one of their au pairs in the middle of a missing persons case. So they send her back to Germany. And so, you know, there goes Stephen's girlfriend. Um, now he has, a, he has agreed to talk to police, but he does some really dumb things that show he's not exactly the brain trust. Uh, first, he tells the cops that he heard Tara on the phone telling someone that she would meet them at the end of the driveway. Well, police run a check of Tara's phone records, and she wasn't on the phone with anybody during the time that Stephen says he heard this conversation. And there is no record of her having ordered a car. I mean, these are easily verifiable things. So again, Stephen, not the sharpest tool, as uh, the song goes. Then there was the fact that he waited five days to report her missing, which not suspicious at all, at all. Also suspicious, I mean, no, not suspicious, <laughs> um, is that world traveler Tara is not using her credit cards. She's not using her laptop. She's not using her phone. She has gone completely off the grid. Again, not suspicious. Okay, so, you know, a story like this 
tailor-made for the news, right? Pretty young mother, successful from an upscale neighborhood. I mean, this is, it's going to get, and it does get, massive news coverage. This became locally just a major obsession, quite frankly, with the local media. And right in the center of the hurricane is Stephen Grant. He's always calling local reporters, basically begging to give interviews. And boy, does he give interviews. He is constantly on the news, seeming, at the beginning at least, as though he's the impassioned and concerned spouse who just wants his wife to come home safe and sound. But the cracks, they start to come out about his deep, deep, deep feelings of inadequacy. In a fairly telling interview that Stephen gave to George Hunter of the Detroit News, he's no longer pretending to be the worried husband, but the angry, bitter Mr. Mom, as he lets his frustrations about his marriage spill out for all to see. He told the paper that he and Tara were in a battle of sorts about who was in charge, saying they fought over, quote, trying to show who's boss and who's going to run the household. It didn't need to be that way. Basically, he wanted her to just acquiesce to whatever he wanted because he thinks that he should be uh, king of the hill in the house. He also took major umbrage to an interview that Tara's sister Alicia had given previously to that same paper, particularly the praise that Alicia gave Tara as a mother when she noted that her sister was a loving mother who often flew home to be part of the kids' events and activities. Stephen disputed this, saying, quote, some of her family has said in the media how much she loved her kids and how she would try to fly back in order to attend their functions. But that's not true. I can't recall one time when she did that. Well, then he really mentions it all when he says, quote, To be honest, as weird as it sounds for me to say this, I was the perfect mom, not Tara. I mean, <laughs> sour grapes, it is a thing. It really, really is. So while Stephen is out here playing poor, poor, pitiful me, it does not change the fact that he is suspect numero uno in Tara's disappearance. At this point, Stephen refuses to take a polygraph, saying that he felt like police were harassing him because they did have him, of course, under surveillance. Um, but in addition, police just don't have enough to get a search warrant for the house. And it's not until late February that they catch a break when someone walking in the woods behind the Grant house finds a plastic bag with plastic gloves, metal shavings, which remember Stephen works in a tool and die shop. Oh, and blood. Again, not suspicious, right? Well, it is the probable cause that police need. And finally, in early March, they get a court ordered search warrant and they head to the Grant house. They ask Stephen to scoop, to move, get out the way so that they can conduct the search unimpeded. And so Stephen puts a leash on the dog so they can go for a walk. TV cameras capture him taking a casual glance over his shoulder in the direction of his house as he keeps on walking. Meanwhile, cops are searching and searching and searching and searching. They wind up in the garage of the house, and one of the detectives notices a plastic storage bin that seems out of place. So they open it. And that's when cops realize that Stephen has pulled a fast one on them. Because as it turns out, Stephen is in the wind. He's borrowed a truck from a neighbor, and he's disappeared. Authorities track Stephen's cell phone, and coupled with a tip from his sister, from Stephen's sister, they beeline to Wilderness State Park, 200 miles away, where indeed they do find Stephen. It's 6.30 in the morning. He's sitting outside, propped up against a tree in 14-degree weather. No coat, no shoes, and in full-on delirium. Stephen is taken to the hospital to be treated for frostbite and hypothermia, and as Dateline noted, because he never gets tired of talking about himself, there is nothing left for him to do but mention it all and tell everyone what happened to Tara. February 9th, 2007. Tara returns home from her trip to Puerto Rico. And remember that she and Stephen previously have been arguing about her traveling so much and how he wants her home. 
He's also decided that she's having an affair and he's all in his feelings about that she doesn't respect him and he's emasculated and all the things. And he tells her that she's abandoning the family. According to Stephen, Tara turns her back on him and in response, he grabbed her by the wrist and she slapped him. He said she told him that she was going to take the kids and kick him to the curb and he was going to be homeless and for good measure, called him a piece of shiz. He says that he knocked her down and that at that point, he grabbed a piece of clothing, wound it around her neck, and he choked her. For all of his whining about how Tara doesn't respect him, she doesn't show him uh, what she what he believes he's entitled to, he does understand that if she leaves him, his life will be quite different and not in a good way. And he can't let that happen. So he keeps strangling her. And finally, she stops breathing. Tara Lynn Grant was 34 years old. Stephen then wraps a belt around his wife's neck and he drags her body down the stairs into the garage. The belt snapped and Tara's head slammed into the concrete floor, a horrifying sound that, T that Stephen described as, quote, dropping a watermelon on the cement. He puts her body into the back of her own SUV, and then he heads back into the house. And after all of this, he sends a text message to Verena, the au pair, saying, quote, you owe me a kiss. This guy is just a creep up on creep up on creep. And like, did I mention that he's a creep? And so speaking of Verena, when she gets back to the house that night at 1130, remember, she, he had sent her out during the day. She and Stephen have another tryst. Like your kids are sleeping down the hall, your wife's body is in the garage, and you're hiding the au pair under the sheets. Like, you have to have a special kind of mind for that shiz to be going on. Oh, but it gets worse. It gets so much worse. Stephen keeps Tara's body in the garage for two days while he tries to figure out what to do. What he comes up with is that he drives Tara's body to his father's tool and die shop where he dismembers it by using a hacksaw blade. He told police, quote, I just told myself, look, if you don't do this, you're going to prison for the rest of your life. And I just kept cutting her. By the time he was finished, Stephen had cut Tara up into 14 pieces. After he was done, he piled his wife's remains onto the red plastic snow sled that belonged to his kids and scattered the body parts in the woods before burying her torso in the snow. And once he knew cops were coming to search his house, he went back to the spot where he had buried the torso and dug it up, storing it in that plastic bin that he put in his garage, which is where police found it. Detective Brian Kozlowski, who was investigating Tara's disappearance, told Dateline his reaction upon finding this torso was what the F. Well, <laughs> what the F indeed. At one point in his confession, Stephen admitted that all he could think was, quote, I got away with this. I can't believe I got away with this. Well, he didn't get away with it because Stephen was arrested on March 4th, 2007. He was found guilty of second-degree murder on December 21st of that same year, and he was given a sentence of 50 to 80 years, with Judge Diane Druszynski calling his actions, quote, demonic, manipulative, barbaric, and dishonest. Stephen also received an additional 6 to 10 years for mutilating Tara's body, though he was able to serve that concurrently with his main sentence. And speaking of that main sentence, that 50 to 80 years, he tried all sorts of ludicrous appeals to get his conviction overturned, 
saying that all of the pretrial publicity had tainted the case, forgetting it seemed that he was the lead uh, megaphone yapping his mouth to anyone who would listen about Tara and himself, mostly. He also declared that the judge should have suppressed his hospital room confession because apparently his uh, lawyer had quit, uh, I guess, after he was arrested, found, you know, after he found out that he lied about all these things. So his lawyer quit. But then when the police came and talked to him, they asked, it's on tape, they asked, do you want to speak to us without an attorney? And he said yes. So he, he knew his rights. He had his rights. But he wanted that thrown out. Um, and so not surprisingly, all of those appeals were denied. He has to serve the 50 to 80 years. And the first possibility that he has for parole is in 2057 when he is 87 years old. Stephen's father, William Allen Grant, who owned the tool and die shop where Stephen dismembered Tara's body, could never get over what his son did, nor the small part that his business played in this gruesome tragedy. In June of 2014, he died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. Verena the au pair testified against Stephen at his trial. She returned to her native Germany and lives a quiet life out of the spotlight. Tara's sister Alicia and her husband were granted custody of Tara and Stephen's children, Lindsay and Ian, who were four and six at the time of their mother's murder, raising them in Ohio. Each year, in partnership with Turning Point, an agency that works to empower survivors of domestic and sexual violence, the family participates in Tara's Walk to raise funding and awareness about domestic and sexual violence. Lindsay and Ian have no contact with or a desire to speak to their father. If you or someone you know is having suicidal thoughts, please call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline 24 hours a day at 800 800- Two seven three eight two five five. And if you or someone you know is being affected by sexual or domestic violence, please call the National Domestic Violence Hotline 24 hours a day at 800-799-7233. Thank you so much for joining me for another episode of The Dark Side of Love. I'm your host, Bianca Sloan, and show your love for The Dark Side of Love by visiting thedarksideoflove.com for show notes and transcripts. While you're there, sign up for my newsletter to be notified about new episodes. You can also find a link to my Patreon page where you can access bonus material and other fun stuff. Learn more about my suspense novels about the dark side of love by visiting biancasloan.com. Thanks for hanging out with me and join me next time for another tale of love gone wrong. I'll see you on the dark side. <laughs>